All right, we'll be starting uh, today in Luke chapter 21 and in Isaiah chapter 13. And we'll eventually get to Revelation chapter 6. Also, as I bring uh, another installment in our series of messages from John's book of the Revelation. This will be the tenth message in the series, having covered chapters 1 through 5 in the first nine messages. And the main reason I brought this series of messages was to focus in on, on the person and the precepts and the praise and worship of the Lord Jesus himself that we did see revealed there in those first five chapters of the book, where I think we got a revelation of the real Jesus and uh, you know the risen and glorified Lord Jesus and studying through those letters to the seven churches of Asia. I believe we gained a much better understanding of uh, what Christ expects from his churches and from each of us here today also. And then in chapter 4 to 5 last week, we saw a vision of that heavenly chorus of literally millions of both angels and redeemed saints joining together in glorious praise and worship of the Lamb of God. And so that revelation of the Lord Jesus himself and that understanding of what he demands of us today is really the main reason I launched off on this study. So at this point, uh, since I've actually covered much of the remaining uh, chapters in prior messages, I'm going to move much faster now to kind of uh, wrap up this series with a more cursory overview uh, through the book for review and uh, also for application to and from many things that we see happening in our world today. While the letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 to 3 were to churches that were in existence at the time of John's writing, a little over 1900 years ago, upon being called up to heaven in chapter 4 and verse 1, John the Apostle was also transported into what was, from his perspective, the future, uh, to a point in time that we know from chapter 5, verse 10, where those saints in heaven praised God, saying, and we shall reign on the earth. So he was transported there to a time just prior to the millennial earthly reign of our Lord. Just prior to that time. And to a time that we also know from what follows as the Lord Jesus begins to loose those seals from off the scroll that he took there. It was also to a time just prior to the period that the Lord Jesus described in Matthew 24, verse 21 as a time of, quote, great tribulation. He said, since as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be again, he said there. Saying also, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. And at that verse there in Matthew 24, verse 21, of course, Jesus is quoting almost verbatim from a prophecy in Daniel 12, 1 to 2, about that very same time of trouble. And since it, I believe it does appear from current uh, signs and conditions in our world that we'll consider momentarily, it does appear that that day of great tribulation is drawing very near. John was therefore transported in both time and space to that scene in heaven and the heavenly praise and worship of the Lord Jesus that actually may be transpiring right now, even at this very moment, possibly, uh, from John's perspective to the future, but from ours to the present. And so as the Lord Jesus may have even now already have taken that scroll from the hand of him that sat on the throne, God the Father, and actually may at any time be preparing to loose those seals while that heavenly chorus of millions of holy ones rejoice and sing his praises. I think that's quite a thought to contemplate. That that scene described in Revelation 5 could actually at this very moment be transpiring. So then most of the remainder of the book from chapter 6 through 19 is for the most part devoted to revealing details, more details about the cataclysmic judgments that will be poured out from heaven during that time upon this Christ-rejecting, sin-cursed world. After the Lord Jesus takes that scroll and during that time of great tribulation that results from those seals being loosed, of that time of great tribulation, also the Lord Jesus was recorded in Luke chapter 21, verse 25, quote, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, 
distress of nations with perplexity. He said, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. He said, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Verse 21, he said, and then, at that time, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then Jesus said, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. There are several passages in the Old Testament, actually, where we also read of that same time of global great tribulation using similar language, actually, similar terms that we see repeated in the New Testament. One is here in Isaiah 13, where we read beginning in verse 9, Isaiah writes, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Isaiah writes in verse 10 of chapter 13, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. God says, And I will punish the world for their evil. Not just Israel. This isn't just a judgment on Israel. I will punish the world, coming on all the world, for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Verse 12, I will make a man more precious and fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth, shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. That day is going to come on this Christ-rejecting world. Turn over to Isaiah 24. Several passages in Isaiah about that day, the day of the Lord, many times just referred to as that day. Isaiah 24 is another one where Isaiah writes, verse 1, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Let's skip down to verse 23. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed and the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients gloriously. So that's a, a, a prophecy of the coming millennial reign. Turn over to chapter 34. Isaiah 34. Ten chapters to the, to the right. Another passage here. Isaiah 34. We read here, verse 1. Come near, ye nations, to hear. And hearken, ye people, let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, not just Israel, upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth off the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. We see other references to that same time in Isaiah and also in Daniel and Jeremiah and elsewhere. So these Old Testament prophecies are actually foundational to what we read in the New Testament as we find here actually very similar language and terms that we actually see clearly referenced and actually repeated in the New Testament. John then has given many more details of that time of trouble throughout chapters 6 through 19 of this book. And so with that introduction then, I want us to refer to the outline in the book of Revelation included in your bulletins today. And so at this point, I'm going to try to actually summarize some of what I have presented before about the outline of this book. In chapters 6 through 16, John writes of three series of judgments seven seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6, seven trumpet judgments in Revelation 8 through 11, and finally seven vile judgments in Revelation 16. The popular pre-trib rapture position and also the increasingly popular pre-rap or a mid-trib rapture position that was first popularized actually by Roland Rasmussen in his book back in the 1990s and now also held by Stephen Anderson and others both of those, the pre-trib and pre-wrath position of the rapture, makes a common error of presuming that these judgments, these three series of judgments, occur in linear sequential order. 
In other words, with all seven seal judgments being loose in order, and then the seven trumpet judgments, followed then by the seven vial judgments, all in sequential order. However, in analyzing the sixth seal and the seventh trumpet and the seventh vial judgments, we actually see that they all describe the same events or the same series of events that all take place at the close of the Great Tribulation period. So that just as Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's two separate dreams as one and the same vision, referring to the same pending calamity. In like manner, John's three separate visions of the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven vials are actually three separate visions of parallel portions of that tribulation period. Referring here to this outline, I divide the book into nine sections and noted here in Roman numerals. In section one through three, we have the introduction to the book in chapter one. Um, the message to the seven churches in chapter two to three and the throne room in heaven and the worship of the Lamb in chapters 4 to 5 that we've already looked at in detail in these uh, first several chapters. And we've also looked at some beyond that into later chapters. And then part 4 here of the outline also has several subparts covering chapters 6 through 19, where John describes the tribulation period, which we also know as the 70th week of Daniel chapter 9. As stated here on the outline, and this is very important in the understanding of the book, I state here, quote, the events described in these chapters are not given in chronological order. The sixth seal, seventh trump, and seventh vial judgments all describe the same event, which ends the tribulation at Christ's coming. Thus, the seven seals, trumpets, and seven vials are three separate visions of parallel portions of the period separated by what I call parenthetic interludes. Others call it that as well. Parenthetic interludes at chapters 7 and 11 to 14. In those interludes, John goes both back into past history and to the heavenly throne. The seal judgments encompass the entire 70th week of Daniel 9, with the first uh, two immediately preceding and seventh immediately following, while the trumpet and vial judgments occur only in the latter half of that week. That's my firm belief. I then show in these parentheses here, uh, Revelation 11, 2 to 3, 12, 6 to 7, 14, and 13, 5. These are the scriptures that show uh, the overall time period of the, of the tribulation to be actually be seven years. It's given in those passages as uh, 1260 days and 42 months in time, times and half a time, all referring to a seven year period or actually two, three and a half year periods, and there's two of those, so seven years. And so I then include here a graphic representation of how and when I do believe the seal, trumpet, and vile judgments will be poured out in approximate relation to each other. You see here, I, I personally definitely believe that the seven seals encompass the entire seven year period, and that actually uh, the first and second seal I have to be loose before that period can begin. And so with that, uh, look at the outline. Please turn to Revelation chapter 6 and Matthew 24. I want to look at uh, several passages to, in fact, show that as stated here that the sixth seal and the seventh trump and seventh vial judgments all do actually describe the same event, which ends the tribulation at Christ's coming. And thus that the seven seals, the trumpets, and the vials are actually all three Separate visions of parallel portions of this period. We read in Matthew 24, verse 29. Jesus said, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, note these words here, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. As mentioned earlier, we see this very same event and several Old Testament prophecies, especially as we saw in Isaiah 34. And we also see, though, this very same event clearly described at the loosing of the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6, which, again, makes clear reference. John makes clear reference back to Isaiah 34. Revelation 6, verse 12, John says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Well, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood 
And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And heaven departed as a scroll and is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And so we see the same event in Revelation 6 there that we saw back in Matthew 24, verse 29. And we also see, by the way, the same event in other passages, such as in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, where Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And so, the sixth seal here is the same event described by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24, 29. And notice in Matthew 24 exactly when Jesus said that would happen. Matthew 24, verse 29, he said, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So that shows us that the sixth seal takes place immediately after the, tri the tribulation of those days. It doesn't, it doesn't begin the tribulation period as the pre-tribbers think. It's not way back in the beginning before the tribulation starts as some of them actually believe. That sixth seal ends the tribulation immediately after the tribulation of those days, not in the middle or early stages. So this, can really, this one observation completely shatters this linear uh, chronology promoted by both pre-tribbers and pre-rathers. Also notice here the progression in Matthew 24 uh, because this takes place, this sixth seal takes place in direct conjunction uh, with Christ's glorious return in power and glory. Jesus says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so the sixth seal in Revelation 6 is the same event described by the Lord Jesus, which takes place immediately after the tribulation of those days, and right before his glorious return. It's at the same time. So keep a marker in Revelation 6 and turn to Revelation 11. Revelation 11, I want to look at the seventh trumpet judgment, which also takes place at the same time. Revelation 11, the seventh trump, we read verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come. Note the words here. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged. Time of the dead that they should be judged. And that thou should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. They're saying that time has come. Several things that we need to take notice of here that must also lead us to conclude that as with the sixth seal, this event also must also take place in direct conjunction with Christ's glorious return uh, for his own and also immediately after the tribulation of those days. Notice in verse 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Verse 17, we give thee thanks because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. In my mind, it's undeniable that these phrases place the sounding of this trumpet at the end of the tribulation period, after the tyrannical reign of the Antichrist and the false prophet had been brought to an end, the Antichrist was given jurisdiction over the kingdoms of this world for only a short time, 42 months actually, or perhaps less if those days are cut short, as the Lord Jesus indicated in Matthew 24, except those days be cut short, no flesh be saved. But now the kingdoms of this world 
are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. So here Jesus has taken into Him His great power, and He's reigning on His throne. And it also means that by this time also the devil himself has been taken prisoner as well, and he has been shut up and sealed for that thousand years that we read about in Revelation chapter 20. And so look what else this passage says, verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Here we have what? Here we have the judgment seat of Christ. Revelation 11, that seventh trumpet. We've got the judgment seat of Christ here, the judgment of the saints, described by Paul in Romans 14.10 and 2 Corinthians 5.10, where Paul says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So here we have in these verses basically a preview of what we see later in Revelation 20, 4 through 6. So, at the sounding of the seventh trump, several things happen in precise, specific sequence, but which in our view may take place actually in the blink of an eye, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as he also describes in 1 Thessalonians 4. Same, same events going on here. Paul says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. That, that's the very same trumpet, by the way, that we see here in the seventh trump. That is the last trump Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. When Jesus returns at that last trump, the first thing he does is to wipe out the Antichrist and his armies that are gathered together against him at, at Armageddon. As Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. All of these various passages related to the coming of our Lord occur at this time at that blowing of the seventh trumpet. This is also, as I said, the last trump that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. At our resurrection, he says, 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, Paul says, at the last trump. That's that seventh trump. Same, same one. Last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So that's when the rapture occurs, by the way, when we're going to be changed at the last trump, not the first trump or any trump in between. Amen. So this is, again, the very same trumpet that Jesus described in Matthew 24. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. That's that seventh trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. All this takes place at this seventh trump. It has to, by the way. Because at the sounding of this trumpet, again, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. All these things take place at the same time. And so, therefore, both the sixth seal and the seventh trumpet take place at the second coming of the Lord in power and glory immediately after the tribulation period. Now look at verse 19 of chapter 11. Revelation 11:19, 11, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. That also is taking place with the seventh trumpet. Again, that's the same earthquake that we saw at the sixth seal. And from this analysis, it has to be, keep your marker here and turn over to Revelation 16. Revelation 16, I want to look now at the seventh vial judgment. Revelation 16, we see in verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. There's the hail as well. Every stone about the weight of a talent. Just more details are provided. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague there was exceeding great. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see we have the same event here at the seventh, at the seventh vial that we saw back at the seventh trump. 
where it was said that there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Same event. So, the sixth seal, the seventh trump, and the seventh vial all must be the same event, and they describe the same series of events that occur in this planned uh, specific sequence at the coming of Christ immediately after the tribulation of those days. A couple other things worth mentioning here also is that the fourth trump uh, in chapter 8, verse 12, and the fourth vial must each precede the sixth seal. They have to happen before the sixth seal. So it means all those things, the sixth six seal, seventh trump will happen at the end. Revelation 8, verse 12, we read that the fourth angel sounded, fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, just the third part of each. And in Revelation 16, verse 8, we see about we see the fourth vial here. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over those plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So here... That vial is poured out upon the sun at the fourth vial. The sun is given power to scorch men with fire. So both of these judgments have to occur before the sixth seal. Because at the sixth seal, the sun is darkened and the heavens are done away with. And so those both have to happen before that sixth seal we see in Revelation chapter 6. Back to uh, chapter 6 then. Chapter 6, verse 12. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth. Not just a third of them. It doesn't say that. Even as a fig tree catches her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. We read in Isaiah 34. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, I don't know exactly how this is going to transpire, but just as the Lord Jesus spoke the universe into existence, He can do the same here as He scroll, rolls it all up into a scroll. So then, the fourth trumpet of Revelation 8 and the fourth vial, uh, again, of Revelation 16 must precede that sixth trumpet. Therefore, these seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials are not given in the sequential chronological sequence. The sixth seal, seven trumpet, and seventh vial all describe the same event which ends the tribulation at Christ's coming. Before moving on with the outline, I want to go back to read through chapter 6, where we see uh, the first of those three visions or revelations that John's given of the great tribulation period. Last week in chapter 5, we saw where after the Lord Jesus took from the hand of him that sat on the throne, that being God the Father, that scroll that had writing on both sides, he took that scroll that we defined as a title deed to the earth that only he has a claim to, after which we heard that angelic chorus again, praising and worshiping the Lamb, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped uh, him that liveth forever and ever. Then we read in chapter 6 that the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, begins to open those seals on that scroll. By the way, in my opinion, the, uh, the first seal of Revelation 6 must be loosed, and probably the second also, which leads then to the beginning of that 70th week of Daniel chapter 9. We read in Revelation 6 verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. I've covered this in the past Actually, a couple of times. And I'll just repeat today for review that many commentators have seen this verse as foretelling of ultimate victory, actually. They see this crowned conqueror on this white horse as none other than the Lord Jesus, who actually gained victory over the devil at the cross, and he certainly does win the ultimate victory. We see him coming in chapter 19 on a white horse, do we not? And so they see this uh, as ultimate victory in this cosmic battle between Satan and God. Again, we do see Jesus coming in Revelation 19:11 on a white horse. John says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Revelation 19:11. But we also see that the Lord Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 
verse 24, of false Christ. He said, there shall be false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. And it's much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. John, the apostle, writes in 1 John 2.18. He says, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, he said, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it, that it is the last time. That word Antichrist is, I understand, a transliteration of the Greek word Antichristos, which does not mean against Christ as much as it means a substitute Christ, a counterfeit or a false Christ, which is exactly what the Lord Jesus warned us of in his Olivet Discourse. On that basis, then, others, and myself included, see this rider on the white horse as the Antichrist, actually. As that man of sin, the son of perdition, Paul spoke of in Second Thessalonians 2. And that is also mentioned in multiple prophecies we know throughout the Bible that we've looked at, especially the book of Daniel. And I, again, do believe this is the correct view, that the rider on this white horse in this verse is the man of sin, the son of perdition, who the Bible says in Daniel 11 will come in peaceably, it says there in Daniel 11, who must rise to power politically. He must rise to political power before that 70th week can begin. Since that time period actually begins when the Antichrist, the man of sin, confirms the covenant of Daniel 9.27, which is why that first seal has to be loosed, I believe, before... Daniel's ninth, Daniel's 70th week can begin before that specific seven year time period can begin. And so I believe that. I also believe that the second seal, well, we'll get the second seal in a minute. We see in chapter 13, Revelation, and also in Daniel 11, that this man must also lead what the world perceives as the mightiest military nation on earth. But while promising peace, in truth, he foments war and he brings the planet to the brink of destruction. The Lord Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And when the true Christ returns, when he comes, when he goes out conquering and to conquer, which he will do, then he will bring in a true peace, a lasting peace, an eternal peace that will last forever. Not just a temporary peace that ends in warfare, mayhem, and chaos as we see in the next seal. This rider on the white horse here is a false Christ, whom some will even call a Messiah, who comes to power and goes forth promising peace, but it's a counterfeit peace from a counterfeit Christ. And so again, I do believe this is the Antichrist, this first rider here. Now the loosing of this first seal signifies his rise to political power and prominence on the world scene. And then we read in verse 3, and when he, the Lamb, had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The beginning of the tribulation will be marked by a false promise of peace and safety. But shortly after that, we see here the world will be engulfed in warfare which I personally believe will include nuclear warfare, the very type of warfare that Russia and China are both right now preparing and allied together to wage against the U.S., which will then lead to the confirmation of the covenant of Daniel 9.27, which will begin that 70th week. Verse 5, When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And the day this was written, a measure of wheat and three measures of barley for a penny meant a day's wages. What this verse is saying is that a man's paid enough in one day, he can only feed himself, basically. For most people on the planet, a man will not be able to, to pay to feed his, his family. won't be able to afford to feed his family. But then it says, See thou hurt not the oil and the wine, which of course are uh, luxuries enjoyed by the rich. And so this speaks of feast and famine at the same time, a global famine 
for most of the world's population while the ruling elite will still enjoy their luxurious lifestyle. During this time, uh, famine will prevail. Most of the peoples of the world will be impoverished and starving. And we actually certainly see those, con- those conditions developing, I believe, in our world today. Verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. I looked and behold the pale horse. His name that set on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Those very same judgments are then continued and expanded in in more detail in the sounding of the trumpet judgments in Revelation 8 through 11, and also the outpouring of those vile judgments in chapter 16. Let me read verse 9. We covered this in an earlier message. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. We see here in this fifth seal the result of widespread global persecution of Christians that we also see in Revelation 13 where we read in verse 7 of Antichrist, Revelation 13, 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Back to chapter 6 then we Read about that sixth seal, which we already covered. Let's read through it again. Verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And though there was a great earthquake, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaking of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So then, for today, that summarizes in a nutshell... John's three visions in chapter 6 through 16 of the judgments poured out on the earth uh, during that time Jesus called Great Tribulation. In fact, the outline then you see a bit more on the outline there uh, basically describing those seven seals, the seven trumpets, and seven vial judgments in summary. Between which then we have what are referred to here as parenthetic interludes that take place between those three visions. Lord willing, and unless the Lord leads me in another direction, I'll be addressing a few details about these interludes, along with the summary of chapter 17 through 22, the book, in a final conclusion to this series next week. For today, I just I want to make some application here to the present hour and uh, some developments that we're seeing on the world scene to bring this message to a close. For many reasons, some stated in the past and more that have risen recently, I do believe the time may well be at hand and even at the door when these things will be fulfilled and the world will enter into that time of great tribulation that must precede our Lord's return. The first major sign that had to be fulfilled before these things could come to pass and that I believe has been accomplished in our day is the regathering of the Jews to the land of Israel and the preparations that are underway to be able to quickly assemble a third temple at Jerusalem. That has been for some time and continues to be a major sign that at the very least we know we are now in the last of the last days, that the Lord is and has been preparing the world stage for his return. There are many scoffers on this point, as we know, like Chuck Baldwin and others, who due to very poor exegesis, failure uh, to properly interpret many scriptures, wrongly believe that the mass immigration of Jews to Palestine over the past century has no prophetic significance at all 
and that the city of Jerusalem no longer has any place in God's prophetic plan. Chuck Baldwin has come out loudly declaring his general position on this point while conveniently dodging the scriptures that prove him wrong. I covered this issue in the history of the Jewish Zionist movement in depth back in 2017 in our series of messages titled The Controversy of Zion. And I also posted a two-part message in late 2019 publicly challenging Chuck Baldwin on only uh, three of several points that could have been raised. But my first challenge to Brother Baldwin, since he teaches as do the preterists, but Matthew 24, 1 through 31, was fulfilled when Rome destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, was to finally state publicly and precisely how he believes that uh, the last few verses of that passage was fulfilled in AD 70, where we read in verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And we read in verse 31, And he, Jesus, shall send his angels, the Son of Man shall send his angels, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. In his posted messages that I heard on the subject, and Brother Baldwin tried to explain how the preceding verses here were fulfilled in AD 70, but he dodged those last two verses altogether. So I also challenge Brother Baldwin to state publicly if he believes Israel has no place in God's prophetic plan, exactly when and how Zechariah chapter 12 was ever at any time fulfilled in history. Where well, we read there in Zechariah 12 that the Jews will mourn for him whom they pierced, the Lord Jesus, after he delivers them rescues them from an assembly of uh, all the nations of the earth that are gathered together to attack and wage war against Jerusalem. And then my third challenge to Brother Baldwin was from da regarding Daniel 12, verse 1 to 3, where we read, quote, And at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time, by the words, these are the very words there in Daniel 12, verse 1, that the Lord Jesus referred to and quoted from almost verbatim in his Olivet Discourse. And so therefore, this is that very same time of trouble that Jesus referred to. But then what does Daniel record after that? He says, and at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And then he says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So we see a resurrection there. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. So just as we see in Matthew 24, that right after that time of tribulation, Jesus sends his angels to raise the dead, to raise up his saints. So I challenge Brother Baldwin to please tell us if this time of trouble described by Daniel was fulfilled in AD 70, now, what is this general resurrection to life that we see in connection with and immediately following this time of trouble? And then I respectfully notified Brother Baldwin of my online challenge by email. However, to date, he never responded. As far as I know, he never answered the challenge. The fact is, as we know, as we read in Isaiah chapter 11, Romans 10 through 11, Luke 21, and many other passages mentioned in those prior messages about the controversy of Zion, some semblance of national Israel had to be regathered to that land of earthly Jerusalem before Christ's return could be fulfilled. And they also had to be regathered in their present state of unbelief to fulfill those passages as well, especially that of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And so that has now been accomplished. And so in that regard, the stage is now set for the final and ultimate fulfillment of these things. Another major sign of such pending prophetic fulfillment that these things appear to be at the door is, as we mentioned, the creation of this globally integrated electronic banking surveillance and tracking system, enabling literal implementation of the mark of the beast at any given time, which then ties in with and results from yet another major sign that these things are at the door, that being the increasing unification of the nations of the world that we see now bowing down to the dictates of the UN and the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, and which this unification of the, of the nations of the world has now come out of the closet 
and has been blatantly demonstrated for all the world to see via this well-orchestrated fraud of the COVID-19 global lockdown that based on the global propagation of several huge lies, including the hyperinflated numbers of alleged COVID cases and related deaths, the lie that non-symptomatic people can spread the virus, the lie that the wearing of masks provides any protection from infection, the lie that their vaccine is the or their vaccines are the only workable treatment for infection, and now even the lie that the alleged COVID-19 virus has somehow cured the common cold and the flu. Cure for the flu because all, all cold and flu cases are being reported as COVID. These are all huge lies. And that's why this alleged pandemic is a huge fraud. There may be a real virus out there, but it's been hyperinflated. And as a result of these and several other lies, this global lockdown has done precisely what the devil's globalist minions intended to, to accomplish with it. It has decimated economies and closed businesses down globally while putting hundreds of millions of people out of work globally and to see billions of people the world over into complying with the restrictions like good UN citizens should do. This is, this is a situation that's never happened in history. We never had this global movement, basically, of nations participating in this type of a fraud, with all the media participating together as well. They've all agreed together, basically, to perpetrate this fraud. And this has created, of course, uh, the perfect pretext needed by the globalists for impositions of uh, far more global tyranny and suppression of rights, including that of free speech, we know, and what's being called the cancel culture of the ultra-liberal far left, also known as Marxist communists, have taken over in, in D.C., who have, for all practical purposes, actually now declared political and legal warfare on the Constitution, on free speech, on the freedom of assembly, freedom, freedom to travel. As we see Joe Biden now, I don't know if you heard, recently now planning to implement and enforce domestic travel restrictions within the U.S., talking about that now. This COVID-19 scamdemic, of course, has also created the perfect pretext, as we know, for an assault on our fundamental right to enjoy good health and life. Now, with even double masking restrictions uh, that amount to breathing restrictions on our fundamental right to breathe fresh air rather than our own CO2 exhaust. It's also created the perfect setup of the mark of the beast via denial of our basic human right to refuse the vaccination. Lord Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 16, verse 2, He said, When it is evening... You say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. In the morning it will be foul weather today. The sky is red and lowering. He said to the Pharisees, Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not, Jesus said, discern the signs of the times? In other words, they should have known from the Scriptures, they could have known from Daniel, that he was the promised Messiah. In the same way, though, some Christians today are not discerning the signs of the times in our own generation. They're not watching for the Lord's return. Instead, they're sleeping, uh, just like in the parable of the sleeping servants that Brother Jay taught on last week. And this globally orchestrated fraud in itself should serve really as a huge alarm clock to awaken sleeping worldly Christians and tell us how late it is on God's prophetic time clock. All that said, though, there still are many things that must happen before that 70th week can begin especially, as mentioned earlier, the rise of the Antichrist to political power and his confirmation of the covenant of Daniel 9.27. Many people thought and still believe that Donald Trump is and remains that man of sin, especially since on leaving office he said he'd be back in some form. And again, I've held that up only as a possibility and I've listed several reasons in prior messages for saying that Trump has been the best candidate to come along yet to fulfill that role. However, I also think it's possible that Trump may well not be the man and may have merely served as a very useful puppet for the globalists. A Manchurian candidate, as I pegged him back in 2016, who drew popular support and even attracted the adulation and the adoration 
and almost a worship, actually, of millions of people worldwide who believed his lies of standing for populist and conservative causes, but who we know in reality served the very same globalist deep state masters that Joe Biden serves today. And so, again, as such, I do believe that uh, Trump did his job very well in dividing the nation asunder to divide and conquer, getting Christians and even non-Christian conservatives labeled in the minds of the rising majority of Marxists in this nation as dangerous extremists and domestic terrorists, luring them there, as he did for three weeks to Washington, D.C., and certainly uh, did, in my view, incite what took place there, but he, of course, was aided by many Asian provocateurs and uh, Antifa types. And also aided, of course, by the deep state's QAnon PSYOP machine, which is still pumping out propaganda, claiming that Trump is somehow going to make his comeback into the White House this coming March 4th or 5th, they're saying, which some sources are saying is why there is still to this day thousands of National Guard troops standing guard at the Capitol. So we have all these signs, and we can list others as well. But to add more balance to the analysis today, from the time I began posting sermons six years ago, proposing and identifying America as the economic powerhouse and military empire named Babylon in Revelation 18, I have always conditioned that by saying that if the Lord Jesus is to return anytime soon, America must be identified, I believe, as that same entity. And I still believe there's no other logical conclusion that we can draw for reasons that have already presented. And in that case, and again, if the Lord Jesus is to return anytime soon, I do believe still that the Antichrist must rise to power through the office of the U.S. president. The office that at present Joe Biden seems to hold. And of course, we all know that Joe Biden is not the man. However, we also have to acknowledge that as convinced as many people are the world over about Donald Trump being either a savior or the Antichrist and that he's going to come back into power. And while we anxiously long for and we eagerly await our Lord's return and we don't want him to tarry any longer, we want him to come now. But we still need to remember also that it may well not be the Lord's plan for that great tribulation to begin quite yet or for the Lord Jesus to return as soon as we'd like or as soon as we hope. It may possibly even instead be in the Lord's plan to wipe out America as a superpower and raise up another military empire in its place through which the Antichrist would then rise. That's quite possible. We don't, we don't know. However careful we may be in our projections, or to whatever degree we may feel that we got to work in the Lord into these things, we have to remember that the Lord Jesus said, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. He said, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And so therefore, with that bit of balance added into the mix here, and having understanding of the times, while seeing how Israel has been regathered in unbelief to the land and a somewhat unified global government system has arisen and the stage appears to be set, while watching and seeing how current events may well be lining up to bring all these things to pass, we still have to stay balanced. While we long for all these things to be fulfilled and to be finally delivered from this wicked world and to see our Savior face to face, we also have to recognize that his coming may be farther down the road than we'd like. We do need to prepare ourselves as much as we can to face days of tribulation and suffering and persecution that may well lie ahead, perhaps right at the door, perhaps. And we do also need to live like he could come for us at any moment, because it's quite true that for all of us, our lives could end today. Jesus could come for me today. And so just as John says in 1 John 3, verse 3, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We need to purify ourselves and live holy lives, being ready to see Jesus at any time. But at the same time, we also need to make plans for the long haul. We can't be like the Millerites and sell all our goods and base all of our economic plans 
on our belief that these things are about to be fulfilled in the next few years. We need to be wise. We need to plan as possible. For instance, to leave an inheritance to our children's children, as Proverbs 13.22 says a good man is supposed to do. And by the way, the best inheritance that we can leave to them is a godly, God-fearing example and an inheritance in the kingdom of eternal life. Amen. But we also need to prioritize the work of the kingdom in making disciples and winning the lost. And as Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. We do need to watch for signs of Christ's coming and be on guard. But like the workers on the walls of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day, we need to keep our sword in one hand and our trowel or our work hammer in the other. I mentioned at the beginning of the message that the reason I began this series of messages was to focus in on the person, the precepts, and the praise and worship of the Lord Jesus himself that we did see in those first five chapters. To see the real Jesus, to get a better understanding of what Christ expects, not only from his church, but from us individually as, as his people. As a reminder, we saw in those seven churches a common message given to all. Again, if you recall that the Lord Jesus knows our works, he will judge them. He'll bring every one of our works into judgment. We saw in those letters that the Lord Jesus expects us to serve him, expects us to be busy, to be working for him, worshiping. Him through personal sacrifice, as we talked about last time. Sacrificially giving Him our time to advance His kingdom. We saw that the Lord expects us to be willing to suffer persecution and even death for Him, to be faithful unto death. We saw in those letters that He expects us today, just as He said in Matthew 5, He expects us to be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. We saw that in these letters to the churches. The first and foremost, we saw also in that letter to Ephesus, the Lord Jesus expects us to keep him at the center of our lives as our first love, to love him with all of our hearts, our minds, our soul, and our strength. And so that really is a message for today, as Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. After prayer, we'll go ahead and sing, It's well with my soul. Knowing these things are coming on in the world, it's well with my soul. I hope it is with yours as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the... Uh, the power it gives us. We thank you for the joy it gives us. We thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the wisdom it gives us to know how we are to live in this evil day and help us to keep our eyes focused on you, Lord, knowing these things. Help us all to do that, to keep our eyes on you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Hymn 256, it is well with my soul. Let's sing that one. <laughs>